Welcome back, folks. Oceanography 2001, lecture number two. Today, we're going to look at plate tectonics, which is basically the structure of the Earth's crust. We'll probably discuss the uh, layers of the Earth a little bit, and we will discuss the ocean floor today. Right there, that is a picture of the Sinai Peninsula that is in the Middle East, very hotly contested between Egypt, Israel, Lebanon. Uh, that little peninsula is right on a rift. The Red Sea is spreading and that peninsula is being pulled. Uh, right now, from the looks of it, it will stick with Asia versus Africa, much like Florida stuck with North America rather than Africa. But that little peninsula there is right along a oceanic spread center and a continental rift. Alfred Wegener hypothesized that the earth was made of plates and these continents moved around. Uh, he was basically uh, laughed at because you know, modern uh, thinking at that time was the earth was rather static. It was changing very slowly if you went with Hutton's theories of geology, or it was not changing at all except for uh, ca catastrophic events if you went with uh, the more uh, religious model of uh, earth remaining static unless a supernatural being caused uh, supernatural event. So this uh, plate tectonics was a new um, idea. Wegener was a climatologist and he was studying the ice packs in the North Pole area, the northern uh, ice packs, and noticed uh, how the ice interacted with each other and hypothesized land interacted much the same way. It wasn't until 1968 that this was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt with that Glomar Challenger uh, voyage that we discussed last module. So uh, what you see a picture of here is the jigsaw puzzle that is the continents. They fit together at the continental margins. Notice it's a little beyond the land. Uh, we did touch upon the fact that there's continental shelves. We're gonna get more in depth uh, when we talk about the ocean floor today, but at the continental shelves, they fit together beautifully like a big jigsaw puzzle. And about 225 million years ago was the last time the Earths were in one landmass. That continental uh, landmass is called Pangaea. That means all lands. That's not the only time the land was lumped together in one mass, but it's the last time the land is lumped together in one mass. Uh, as the continent split uh, and drifted apart, the Atlantic Ocean was formed. So the Atlantic Ocean is about 225 million years old. So the first evidence of plate tectonics is the Earth's giant jigsaw puzzle. We just discussed that on the last slide, but you can see in this animation how the continents split and drifted to where they are today. Uh, the second bit of evidence that uh, supports this plate tectonics is the seismograph data. Uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, and other disturbances happen far more frequently on plate boundaries that we call faults than they do elsewhere. The age of the ocean sediments support the uh, seafloor spreading and subduction you can see spreading at the mid-ocean divergent boundaries and subducting at the convergent boundaries ocean sediments are not older than 225 million years where continental crust is over three and a half billion years old at uh, the oldest uh, centers of these continents we call cratons so uh, ocean sediments a lot younger it's being recycled constantly, and this supports continental drift and plate tectonics. 
when we study the migration of the North Pole, magnetic north, and the fact that the poles slip uh, back and forth, they oscillate, uh, flip, I should say, uh, we notice that there's magnetic stripes that are equidistant from the mid-ocean ridges, showing that as the seafloor spreads, it records the history of this polar wandering and polar flipping. Uh, and these are used, you can date the ocean sediments, you can uh, calculate the rate of seafloor spreading. And of course, this is all part of the plate tectonics and continental drift. Again, uh, here's polar wandering uh, from Europe and North America. Notice you're at different angles in Europe and North America, so your compasses will point at a slightly different position on Earth. So the uh, being the Earth is a spinning with a liquid metal center and then a solid metal inner core, uh, it gives off a magnetic field this magnetic field is imperfect, it moves, and you can track this movement in the sediments. Fossil evidence also points to similar origins along continental uh, boundaries. Ancient climate also points to the fact that these continents were once together. Ancient land masses also point to the continental drift. You can see the Appalachian Mountains here uh, move up North America through Britain and then through northern Scandinavia. So when you pile all the evidence up, and this is before uh, the Glomar Challenger, and now satellites can measure spreading, but when you pile all this evidence up, you come up with continental drift. And here's a picture of Pangaea 250 million years ago, the last time that the Earth had one landmass. As it broke up, you have Laurasia and Gondwana. Okay, so we're being pulled apart. The Pacific Ocean, and then the Tethyus Ocean, the Tethyus Sea or the Tethyus Ocean was the ancient ocean that is now part of the Mediterranean and Indian, whereas you have the New Atlantic and the shrinking, yet still the largest ocean of them all, the Pacific. So basically, Earth's crust is broken up into plates. There's seven major plates, many little minor splinters. Uh, the plates can really take two major types. You have continental and oceanic. Continental crust is made of granite, high in quartz, little lower density, sits higher. Oceanic crust made of basalt, little higher density, thinner, sits lower. Here on this map, you can see and this map really tells a lot. First off, you can see you have your plate boundaries. We call those faults, and the faults are shown. The faults with the flags are subduction. Subduction is one plate is sliding below the other plate, sliding underneath the other plate. So that is considered a convergent, meaning coming together, boundary. You can also see along this mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic, the arrows are pointing to spreading. That is called a divergent boundary. So convergent coming together, crust is destroyed, gets pushed down back into the mantle because it's being recycled. Divergent boundary, it's spreading, crust is being created. They balance each other out. That's called iso static and then you have a side to side movement which is a transform fault look at the famous san andreas fault california coast that is a transform fault 
So you have three types of faults, convergent, divergent, transform. These are plate boundaries. You also see the yellow dots here at Hawaii, the McDonald Seamount, Cape Verde. These areas are where mantle is upwelling. To the mantle's convection, mantle convection, upwelling areas. Those are on oceanic plates, so they're making a type of volcano called a shield volcano. These shield volcanoes have lava flow. They're made of basaltic lava. You have a lot of islands in these areas, like the island of Hawaii. Now, if you notice, in the plate, you have Yellowstone. You have Yellowstone. You have, right here, in Europe, you have, these are in continental areas. They tend to be a more explosive type of volcano because the continents are thicker and the volcano lava doesn't flow as nicely. So they tend to explode. So these are upwelling areas called hot spots. You can be on an oceanic plate, which leads to shield volcanoes. You can be in a continental plate, which leads to more of the explosive type volcanoes. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of uh, plates that are, are going to come up again and again. The Pacific plate, this is called the ring of fire around the Pacific plate. It's moving in a northwesterly direction. So it's subducting in these subduction areas and growing in these spreading centers. There's a little fragment of that plate up here. This uh, is sliding under our North American plate. And that is called the Juan de Fuca plate that is sliding under, uh, causing the Cascade mountain range. Mount St. Helens exploded because of this plate movement. Uh, here's the Caribbean plate. We have the Atlantic subduction right there. That's the Caribbean island arc. You have a mantle plume here, which is a highlight, which is forming Hawaii. We already talked about the transformed San Andreas Fault. Yellowstone is an explosive volcano. Uh, it's a big crater from a previous explosion. A uh, couple other highlights. There's the Challenger Deep and Mariana Trench. Notice we have three plates coming together here, causing the Japan Island Arc. Little subduction here causing the Aleutians. Here, little subduction that's uh, uh, in the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. Here is the Red Sea that is forming and the East African Rift Valley where humans, that's the cradle of humanity, that's uh, splitting apart. The highest point on Earth, the Himalayas, our continent to continent subduction, pushing this landmass up high. So actually the Himalayas are growing. So those are some of the few, oh, here's Iceland. Don't want to forget Iceland. That's a huge shield volcano where the mid-ocean ridge is up above, um, above sea level. So that's a, a little tour of Earth's uh, spreading centers, uh, subduction zones, mantle plumes plates. There's three types of margins we've already talked about. Here's Iceland right here. Iceland's on the mid-ocean ridge, a divergent boundary. There's your fault. So you would have the uh, North American plate right here pulling away. Convergent means coming together. Divergent means pulling apart and transform means sliding by each other. So here's a, the stages of a divergent plate boundary. You get some warping on a continent, then your rift valley. So this is happening here in Africa with that East African rift valley. Uh, and eventually uh, the plates separate 
in this image, it's a growing Atlantic, but you know, right now it's a growing Red Sea as well. And you have a embryonic ocean. And as it spreads further apart, you get development of continental shelves and slopes, sediments build up, and you have a more mature ocean like the Atlantic is today. Seafloor spreading occurs on ocean ridge system, East Pacific rise, mid-ocean ridge. Crust is being created as they separate. You can see here, you have that mantle upwelling, creating new crust. Convergent boundaries, plates are coming together. You can have oceanic plate hitting continent. That oceanic plate is pushed underneath the continental plates. You can have coastal mountains like the Andes. You usually get a trench where that ocean crust is being pushed down. You can have ocean crust hitting ocean crust. Again, you get a, one of the plates slides under the other and you get volcanic island arcs like Japan. You can have continental crust squeezing against continental crust and then you get very high mountains like the Himalayas. So here is South America, the Andes Mountains, the Peru-Chile Trench, your subduction. Here is that Juan de Fuca plate sliding under the North American plate, you have trench, you have coastal island arc. Andes and Cascades are two examples. When ocean crust collides with continental crust, you get deep sea trenches, coastal volcanic island arc. Those are the features. These deep sea trenches are the deepest places in the ocean. Ocean colliding with ocean crust, you still have subduction, one plate subducting, one plate overriding. You don't get the coastal mountains because you're not on a continent, you're in the ocean, you get volcanic island arcs. Notice there's Japan, it's an island arc, meaning it's got a bit of a curvature. You do have a trench, a trench associated with subduction. Uh, generally speaking, you get a marginal sea behind that island arc, like the Caribbean Sea, the Sea of Japan. Along that seam, you get shallow earthquakes, but if you continue toward that island arc, the earthquakes get deeper and deeper because that plate is sliding under. These places are very prone to tsunamis. Every time the plate slides a little bit under the overriding plate, it releases earthquake energy. And of course, because of the ocean nearby, you get huge waves, tsunamis, seismic sea waves. Here is subduction that is ocean to continent. There are your Andes, your coastal island arc. There's your deep sea trench, in this case, the Peru Chile. Notice the earthquakes get deeper and deeper as you move away from the boundary. Here is your formation of your island arc, say Japan or the Aleutians. Deeper and deeper as you move away from the boundary, there's your deep sea trench, there is your island arc, there is your marginal sea. Here is the highest summit in South America, part of the Andes Mountains, caused by uplifting due to plate collision. Here is the Himalayas, how they form. You have sutured, so it's continent to continent. There's no more oceanic plate, but notice that continent to continent causes great uplift, so the Himalayas are growing. Transform boundaries are boundaries that slide by each other. The famous San Andreas Fault is a transform boundary. Mantle plumes are where uh, that mantle is up 
getting pushed up, upwelling due to convection. That is causing islands. That's intraplates in the plates. It's not at a plate margin. Sometimes it's at a plate margin, but in this case for Hawaii, it's in the middle of the Pacific plate. And you can see as it slides, you have a chain of islands. So this, this map summarizes plate tectonics like the other one. You can see the subduction zones, you can see the spread centers, and you can see the hot spots. You can see the rift valleys, you can see, uh, so you can get glean a lot of information from this map. Plate tectonics is powered by convection. You can see here's your upwelling plume, your upwelling plume, your slab push as your convection cell sinks, and what um, the heat comes from residual heat of the earth and radioactive decay. It's hotter in the uh, the deeper you go in the mantle and into the outer core and inner core, causing these plumes, these density flows, convection cells. Now, plate tectonics affects people. It causes earthquakes, volcanoes. Mass wasting is avalanches, huge events, and tsunamis. This image here is from Pinatumbo in the Philippines. This is from National Geographic. Here's your pyroclastic material. That hot ash is moving hundreds of kilometers per hour, and it will flatten forests, villages, whatever it comes in contact with. Tsunamis, when it happens uh, near the sea, they the, the huge wave in the open ocean is not very high. It's got a very long wavelength. And then when it approaches land, that wavelength is compressed. The height grows to upwards of 100 feet and you have huge coastal flooding. It takes hours for it to travel across ocean. So you have time for evacuation if you're far away from the earthquake event. If you're near the earthquake event, there's no time to flee. We also get fertile volcanic soil from these uh, eruption events. Yellowstone, which erupted millions and millions of years ago, left great fertile soil along the Great Plains. All of North America was dusted, obviously closer to the uh, explosion uh, you have great devastation, but volcanic dust contains micronutrients that helps plants grow. You also have metals, ores associated with volcanic. Fossil fuels uh, can be associated with uh, volcanism. Plate tectonics, things like oil, uh, shallow seas produce oil, and these shallow seas uh, are cut off and these basins can concentrate the organics. Geothermal energy can also be uh, used near plate boundaries, like Iceland or California, geothermal. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We'll study the ocean floor. This map right here shows you a lot. Notice the East Coast, wide continental shelf steep slope, and then your abyss. So all of this material, continental shelf and in, is granitic. All of this material, ocean basin, is basaltic. Granite and granitic rocks contain a lot of quartz. They're light in color. They're less dense. Ocean crust, basaltic rock, less quartz, higher metal content, more dense, thinner. So this map is a relief map. It shows you three-dimensional, uh, a three-dimension uh, to it. So here's your spreading center, your mid-ocean ridge. This is your abyssal plains with old seamounts, old extinct volcanoes. Up oh, there's your mantle plume, the uh, Bermuda. Here is your 
continental margin, shelf break. Uh, you do have sediments built up down here. And then you have your wide continental shelf that is indicative of a passive non-tectonic margin. Wide continental shelf. Here, notice there's your Puerto Rican trench, subduction, your island arc and your Caribbean Sea. So let's have a look. Oceans cover 71% approximately of our planet right now, but this changes with the rise and fall of sea level. Oceanic crust, on the other hand, now remember, part of the continent's underwater. 11.4% of the continents are underwater. So oceanic crust, uh, if we do the math really quick, we're looking at 30, 52, 55, 56, roughly 56% of our planet is basaltic, which means roughly 44% of our planet is granitic. So this ocean rises and falls, the continents, the continental margins then move, continental shelves are periodically uh, exposed when sea level is low and when sea level is high, they're covered. If you look at the topography of ocean floor versus land, they can be similar. You have mountains and, 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 and things, but here A to B is land. A to B is land. Here's your Rocky Mountain, your West Coast, your flat Great Plains, East Coast Appalachian Mountains. If you go across the Atlantic Ocean, continental shelf, continental slope, abyssal floor, oceanic ridge, abyssal floor, a little bit of a rise there due to plate tectonics, and then continental slope, continental shelf. So right about here, from here to here, you have basaltic crust. So you have two major categories, continental margins, which are parts of the continent that are underwater, and then the ocean floor, which is your abyssal floor, basaltic, seamounts, guyotes, uh, oceanic ridge system. Continental margins are the continental shelf, continental slope. So you have your shelf, your slope, the shelf break is where granite transitions to basalt. And then continental rises are sediments that have accumulated due to erosion. When you look at the deep ocean, you get the ridge system, which has hydrothermal vents in it. You get your abyssal plains and hills, which are seamounts and guyos. And then those trenches and island arcs are basaltic as well. This is a great image of a passive margin. We call that Atlantic type because our Atlantic Ocean is a passive margin. Ancient riverbeds are submarine canyons that cut across this continental shelf, not as deep as trenches, perpendicular to the coast due to rivers, wide shelves, like I mentioned, passive. So you get these sediments build up. This is where fossil fuels can occur on these passive boundaries, shallow seas. Here, continental rise, your deep sea fan is sediments that have eroded. And now this ocean crust is your basalt. This is all your granite, continental crust. Shelf break would be right there. An active boundary, like the Pacific Ocean, you have, here's your subduction, your trench, narrow continental shelf. This could be hundreds of kilometers wide, not at all narrow. Coastal island arc volcanoes. Notice you don't have that fossil fuel buildup here and it gets deep quick. So that is the difference between the Pacific type margin and the Atlantic type margin. Pacific being an active margin with a fault nearby, passive 
no faults nearby. So this uh, is just another view here, South America, your continent, active margin on the West Coast, East Coast, passive margin, continental shelf, slope, abyss here, narrow shelf, quick slope down to a trench, and abyss. Coastal mountains, West Coast, broad, flat, East Coast. So that is the differences between active margins, which have a fault nearby, passive margins, which are far from a fault. Two major type of continental margins. Sea level, I mentioned, rises and falls with the oscillations in glacial and interglacial periods. So about 15 thousand years ago we had a spike in sea level as we exited the Wisconsin glaciation period and entered our current interglacial period. Sea level rose on the order of 400 feet in a short, geologically speaking, short period of time, causing great coastal floods. A lot of these flood stories were passed down in lore, but you can see sea level periodically rises and falls with the changes in Earth's climate. Our continental slope is that steep drop off down and then we have our shelf break. Submarine canyons are ancient riverbeds that have been cut into the continent but now are underwater. Deep sea fans are part of the continental rise. So in summary, there's the Hudson River Canyon, there's the Continental Shelf, there's the uh, Continental Rise at the bottom, the, the, the uh, uh, ocean floor, the abyss. Turbidites are, turbidity currents are like underwater avalanches, all this sediment uh, goes down. It could cause a tsunami, a huge underwater avalanche. Here is an image of one of those avalanches occurring. Moving on to the deep ocean floor, the first thing we'd look at, spreading centers. Here, here is the fastest area, almost 16 centimeters per year. So you have slow areas, 1.5 centimeters, fast spreading areas here. And of course, where you have spreading, you have subduction. Hydrothermal vents, they're really cool, these hydrothermal vents, because entire ecosystems surround them. Uh, they're referred to as black smokers because the uh, gases that come out of them are rich in hydrogen sulfide, which is black. So it looks like black smoke, although it's minerals pouring out of them. These minerals provide energy for chemosynthesis. Bacteria use these for chemosynthesis, so entire food chains are uh, associated with these hydrothermal vents. The abyssal plains are the largest features of the ocean floor. You can see here, they're relatively flat, large expanses. So right here, you know, your mid-ocean ridge with depth, here's your continental shelf and all this is your deep ocean floor your abyssal plains seamounts and guyotes tabletops guyotes are tabletops seamounts they're just extinct undersea volcanoes they reach up a little shallow so deep ocean currents get pushed up upwelling bringing nutrients to the surface from the deep ocean so and, and they're a little shallower so they may or may not get sunlight but these things are biological hotspots because you're getting upwelling with nutrient and the possibility of sunlight for photosynthesis. So uh, seamounts and guyouts are great places, biologically speaking. Trenches, we already mentioned trenches. There's the Puerto Rican trench forming in a three-dimensional view are areas that 
subduction is occurring. One plate is being pushed under the other, and these trenches are the deepest points in the sea. So you can see here is the Challenger Deep, part of Mariana Trench. And here is where your trenches form on these island arc areas. So taking an overview of a passive margin, notice the large shelf, the expanse we know as the abyssal plain, your mid-ocean ridge, and then you have a small area of subduction here. Uh, this is a lot of sediment, a lot of erosion occurring, so we have a lot of sediment here. This is one of the largest dead zones in the area because all this nutrients, nutrients from the rivers spill into this area causing nutrient pollution. Eutrophication is nutrient pollution. Too many nutrients lead to explosive algal growth, which dies, decays, and starves the area of oxygen. So too much of a good thing, if you will. The Pacific margin is the ring of fire. Ring of fire, narrow shelf, steep slope, deep ocean, close to shore. Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean, subduction areas, active. There's your Java, there's your spreading center, the Java Trench. Uh, and much like uh, you have your abyssal floors around. Now, the ocean floor is not bare rock, it's covered in sediments. This image is a coccolith that's microalgae. Each one of these little spheres is an individual single-celled algae belonging to the kingdom Protista. They are photosynthetic and they are a type of plankton. They ride on currents. Ocean sediments can be classified by size. The Wentworth scale is uh, clays the smallest, silt, sand, pebbles, cobbles, boulders, uh, sediment, you can classify it by size, or where it comes from. A biologic particle is called biogenius. That would be the little coccolith, when it dies, would be a biological particle. Uh, a lithogenous from the lithosphere would be erosion, erosion, uh, sand, sediments, minerals. So where it comes from is how most oceanography uh, classifies its ocean sediments. Uh, we can look at the Wentworth scale here, which I mentioned, size. We'll take a look at lithogenous or terrogenous. It depends on the text. Terra means earth, litho is the um, lithosphere. So I've seen lithogenous, I've seen terrogenous sediments. Biogenous sediments come from microorganisms. Uh, it's also called ooze, O-O-Z-E, biogenous ooze. Hydrogenous uh, comes directly from the seawater, usually because of some chemical process or temperature swing causes precipitation. Cosmogenius is from outer space. So here's terrogenous sediments washing in. Most of the continental margins are covered in terrogenous sediments. That continental rise is terrogenous sediments. So by mass, far greater because it's thick. It doesn't cover as large a range as biogenous sediments, but it's a lot thicker and by mass. Uh, there's more of it. Biogenous sediments can be calcareous, calcium-based life, or siliceous, silica-based life. This is a very important marine plankton called the foraminifera. Uh, foraminifera are calcium-based protists. So that's a little calcium shell. When they die, they build thick layers of limestone. Biogenous sediments here 
from outer space, you can see right here, this plume of cloudy water. That's a plankton bloom. That's a coccolithal plankton bloom. Hydrogenous sediments, like these manganese nodules, precipitate out of seawater at great depths. Methane hydrates uh, are hydrocarbons that uh, precipitate out of seawater in cold, cold, and great pressure. We mine them as energy. Cosmogeneous sediments tend to be really smooth because they're polished as they enter the atmosphere due to the great heat. This summarizes pterogeneous, biogeneous, hydrogeneous, cosmogeneous, where it comes from, what it's made of. Notice there's that term ooze, where it's most prominent, and the percent of ocean floor covered. That's not the mass. This pterogeneous by mass would be a greater amount because of the thickness of the deposits. And this shows where it's distributed. Neuritic means over the shelf, which is mostly pterogeneous. Pelagic, which means over the abyss, which is biogeneous, greater percentage. So this here, look at, you have pelagic clays because it's the smallest and all these oozes over the uh, deep ocean, oozes. Uh, and then you have pterogeneous larger sediments near the continental margins. So this is just a map showing where each sediment dominates. You still have mixture, but each sediment dominates in that particular area. So areas near shelves are generally pterogeneous. Areas over the deep ocean are a dusting of clay, the smallest, and then oozes. You can see here, deep ocean currents leave little ripples. And here, you can see here's the brittle stars. There's a fish. Uh, they're leaving tracks. And these will remain relatively unchanged for centuries until something crawls over them or that small disturbance causes them to rustle. Turbidity currents, as we mentioned, are these undersea avalanches. As they fold down, they form layers called turbidites. Ooze is the term for unconsolidated biogenous sediment. So, marine snow, a calcareous ooze, shallow, warm. Calcium dissolves at depth or in colder water. So, you don't have calcareous ooze in the cold water, it's dissolved. You don't have calcareous ooze deep, it's dissolved. So, we call that the calcium compensation depth. Calcium carbonate is found in warm, shallow water. It's the dominant ooze. Silicious silica ooze would dominate in the deep, cold water. So that's the carbonate compensation depth. Here, the great calcareous cliffs of Dover. Here are the organisms, foraminifera, Cocoliths. Here is foraminifera and then some silicious radiolarians. Pteropods are small snail like creatures. Cocoliths are those single cell algae. Silicious ooze. Diatoms and radiolarians are silicious skeleton organisms. Here are the diatoms. Here are the cliffs of diatomaceous earth. Here are the radiolarians. They kind of look like space helmets to me. 
Our manganese nodules are the next type, hydrogenous sediment. They precipitate out at depth. And evaporite, our sediments that are left behind, salt is a major evaporite. Olite or olithic sands are sands caused by ooze. They tend to be white, olithic sands. Some can be pink. Important to remember, all ocean sediments, 200 million, 220 tops. Okay, so they're young because they're constantly being recycled at subduction zones. And new ocean is being created at spreading centers. Here are your oldest ocean sediments at Marianas Trench, and they're being destroyed. Now, here at the rise, you're having new crust being created. Now, we study these sediments. Deep sea cores to get ancient climate, climate information. Placer deposits are precious metals that have eroded from land. And then of course, the uh, crude oil, natural gas, and hydrates. We mentioned that fossil fuels are associated with the ocean floor as well. So these are areas where we mine for placer deposits which are precious metals that have eroded from land, like gold, silver, tin, chromium, titanium. Petroleum, are they form at these passive boundaries where we saw the buildup of organics. An organic molecule is carbon linked to hydrogen based on living things. So uh, as the living things die, that ooze sinks the plankton are covered up and the organics separate out into hydrocarbons so here you have your natural gas oil and then salt water natural gas oil salt water these organisms have separated out by density and that how that's how oil forms oil forms in these shallow seas due to sedimentation of biogenous sediments. We can drill offshore, about 25% of oil is found under the water now, but of course, plate tectonics and the rising and falling of sea level, a lot of it's on land at present as well, ancient seas. So we have to drill here in America. There's our Gulf Coast. Look at all that, that's reserves. Reserves, these are areas where we know there's petroleum and natural gas. Oils start off as light. Volatile means it contains things that evaporate. So when you pull off a crude oil, it's considered light or sweet oil because it has all these volatiles still in it. If you spill that oil or you separate out the volatiles, the oil gets thicker, heavier, and then eventually solidifies and sinks. We take oil and refine it, and almost half of the oil that uh, we mine, mine, mining oil, drill for, goes to gasoline. But you can see some of the other constituents go to diesel, heating, jet fuel, petroleum, asphalt, so a 42 gallon boil or gallon barrel, and when you know that's the typical size of a barrel of oil is 42 gallons, uh, almost half of it goes to gasoline. The last source of sediment energy is the methane hydrates. These methane hydrates form under pressure. It is believed that there's a lot of methane hydrate trapped under the continental, or not the continental, under the polar ice caps. And as the northern ice cap melts and some of the southern ice cap that, that covers the water, this will be 
released into our atmosphere, causing uh, a greater greenhouse effect. But we can use these, and you can see it's kind of like the consistence of sherbet, to mine and for energy. That wraps up lesson number two. I hope you enjoyed plate tectonics, the ocean floor, which we discussed the topography of the ocean floor, and then the sediments that cover our ocean floor. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us.